If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Exodus. Uh, now, we are going to begin uh, looking at Exodus tonight, or not begin, we're going to begin and finish. So the kind of the order of worship for the next few months is going to be uh, each night we'll take a book of the Bible, we'll look at an overview of that book, we'll look at um, the author, the theme, uh, the time of, of writing, and a, just a general overview so that the idea is, is that through the course of this year we can go through the Old Testament so that you can see how that Old Testament points toward Jesus. And so starting now that we get, uh, have gotten to Exodus, this is kind of the format that we're going to see. So first we're going to look at author. And the date of, of writing. Uh, I gave us a map here to show the part of the world that that's in. A lot of people who, who haven't really looked at a, a world map don't maybe don't realize that they, they do not realize how uh, Canaan up there in the upper right hand corner is where it's situated near Egypt and Sinai wilderness. Um, so you, you got that there. It's a little small, I know, but uh, it's, it's still there. So let's talk about the authorship of the book of Exodus. Uh, when I went to uh, Samford, I, I was shocked. Um, one of the very first classes that I took um, in the religion department at Samford was Old Testament survey. And uh, I was you know, 18 years old, had grown up at White's Chapel, had grown up in, in the church, um, expected this to be a, a, an, essentially an in-depth Sunday school class, and um, was shocked when the professor walked in and immediately started mocking the idea that Moses wrote any of the first five books of the Old Testament. Uh, and how silly little people and your, their silly little churches have believed this. And uh, this was the theory that he put forward. That, that, that uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, were written by J, E, P, and D. And I mentioned that when we were talking about Genesis, so I want to go into a little bit of detail with this because if you're not aware of it and you watch something on the History Channel or the Learning Channel, uh, you're going to have people with lots of letters after their name that are going to get on TV and seem like they're very learned and know what they're talking about, and they're going to, to put this forth. Now, where it comes from is, is in throughout the, the Pentateuch, there are different names that are used for God. And so uh, the thinking is that uh, if one author was refer, if I wrote a book about God, I'm not going to, in some cases, refer to him as God, and in some cases refer to him as Lord, and in some cases refer to him as Allah, and in some cases refer to him as Yahweh. I'm probably going to have kind of the same methodology that I use throughout. And so the theory is, is that through the centuries, probably uh, in and around 2000 BC, the first sections were written, and they would have been written by uh, E. Uh, e is the person that whenever he wrote of God, referred to him as Elohim. So in your Bible, in an English translation, if you look and you see uppercase L, lowercase O, lowercase R, lowercase D, that's the way the translators can let you know that God there, or Lord as it's being translated, um, is the, the Hebrew word that's being used there is Elohim. The first book of Genesis, the first chapter of Genesis uh, is God is always referred to as Elohim. Um, J is uh, used through a lot of the Bible, and that's the writer they, they suggest is the one who wrote Yahweh, or there, there is no J in the Hebrew language, so it, the J and the Y are, the sounds are the same. Uh, so like uh, Jesus, uh, if you could have gone back 2,000 years and ran around in Nazareth and saw a little, little boy running around who was Mary's son, and you called him Jesus, you realize he, that he would have known what you were talking about, but um, that w wasn't his name. His name was Yeshua. Um, because there is no J in Hebrew, and, and he had the same name that in English we call Joshua. Uh, and it means God saves. Which is why when the angel said, and you shall call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins, that's why that met came together, because his name means uh, that God saves. So whenever uh, 
that, that J-E sound is used in something. It's usually referring to God doing something. Um, and so whenever in the Old Testament, in English, you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the Hebrew word that's being translated there is Yahweh, Y-W-H-W. In fact, where the name Jehovah came from is uh, in the Hebrew Bible, whenever the word Yahweh is written, they, uh, Hebrew doesn't have vowels, they just so the consonants are the only things that are written out. And where there, in English, would be vowels, they have little dots over the letters. And those are called vowel pointers. Um, and so what you do is you, and Hebrew is read right to left, not left to right. And so when you're reading in Hebrew and you come to a word, you look above it for the, the vowel sounds that would be there, and then you add it. In the Hebrew Bible, in an effort to ensure that no one ever took God's name in vain, Whenever the word Yahweh was written, they didn't use vowel pointers for God's proper name. They used the vowel pointers for Elohim to remind the person who was reading it not to read it out loud. And so they would, when they got to the word God, when they were reading the Bible, they wouldn't pronounce it. They would say Lord instead of God because they didn't want to take God's name in vain. And so the vowels over the Hebrew name Yahweh would be the, for the word Elohim. Well, when in the 18th, 19th century or 17th century, when uh, American evangelicals were translating from the Hebrew and they came across that, they didn't, because they weren't Jewish, they didn't know that, and so they mistranslated that as Jehovah. That's, there's no such word as that. That is someone that didn't know how to read Hebrew trying to translate a word, and they're translating it incorrectly, um, which that sort of thing happens all the time in languages if you don't know what you're doing. There's a guy that works at Johnson's who has a tattoo in Hebrew on his arm, and I uh, have for months, whenever I'm there, I see that, and I, 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 I took four years of Hebrew. I think I, I know how to read it okay, and I kept trying to figure out what in the world because it didn't make sense. It was just like letter salad. And I finally realized that it was the mirror image of the word shalom that someone didn't realize that Hebrew is written backwards from the way that we write it in English. And so they wrote it left to right. And so it's misspelled shalom. And so one day I asked her, I had already talked to Ann about that. And so I asked the guy, I said, so what does your tattoo say? Just curious to what he thought it said. And so he tells me, uh, that it's his name in Hebrew. And I didn't have the heart to go, no, it's not. Um, and Ann, when I, he said, oh, it's my name in Hebrew, and he kind of was really proud of it, Ann, like, pinched really hard on my arm, was like, shut up. <laughs> um, because people take pictures of things, um, I, there's someone that I know well that has a Greek uh, word for God, a tattoo, and it's backwards. It's a mirror image because they had taken a picture of it written down somewhere and their camera flipped it. And they had taken it to a tattoo artist and said, I want this on my arm. And so it's backwards. But, you know, there may be four people in Etowah County that know how to read Greek. So I just don't tell them. I'm just, it's very nice. They, I, I like it. So here that mistake was made. Where someone who didn't know how to read Hebrew uh, looked at it and made up the word Jehovah. So the word is Yahweh, and it is the name for God. And whenever that name is used, the, the critical uh, theorists say that that writer uh, is a different writer. And so e J is uh, the, the person where the name Yahweh or Jehovah is used to refer to God. The assumption is, is that around 900 to 850 B.C. he wrote. D, for J-E-D and P, D stands for Deuteronomy, most of which was written by a different author or authors. Um, and the assumption is, is that around 620 uh, B.C. that they wrote, uh, and that they wrote uh, at a time when Josiah was trying to create reforms, and so he had one of the priestly writers write up these rules so that he could pitch it to the Jewish people and unify them. Uh, P stands for the priestly writer, and that's in Leviticus. And whenever in the Old Testament there's right, priestly rules that are given because the, the way it's written is different and the, the, the style is different. I mean, I can read something that Anne wrote 
Um, and just because of the way that she writes and the language that she uses, I can tell that that's Anne. There's, there's a difference. If you were to go and read something that was written, uh, had, had, did any of you watch the um, Burns special Letters from War? Did any of you see that that was on PBS? I would strongly recommend it. I think you can watch it on Netflix. Ken Burns always does a fantastic job with anything that he does. And so what he did was is he took and read letters that had been written from combat folks back home. And the letters were being read, and then they would have images of both what home looked like. Um, so it was pictures of, you know, antebellum towns or, or during World War II, the, the, the soda shops and that sort of thing, juxtaposition with the scenes from the city and the battle that it was written from. And it was funny to me uh, that you could... And they kind of mixed up the letters from the Civil War era to the Vietnam era to uh, World War I, World War II. You could get four or five sentences into the letter if you weren't wa- looking at the pictures and you knew where, when it was being written. I mean, if the letter started out, my dearest Virginia, today I write to you from the heart of the... You know this is a Civil War letter. If somebody wrote, hey baby, we off in, And do you know you're reading Vietnam. It didn't take but three or four words, and you knew what era it was because you could tell in 1910, people wrote differently, they spoke differently, they talked differently than they did in 1940. That same kind of criticism has been placed on the Hebrew and said that that priestly writer has a different style of writing, he has different words that he uses, he has different flair in his words, and same thing with J-E-P and D. And so these guys have set, gone through the Pentateuch and separated it out in Hebrew and said, these are the parts that's written by J, these are the parts that are written by E, these are the parts that are written by D. All of them are assuming that these were actually written much later than the Bible says that they were written because they were written at the, from the time of Josiah up to the Babylonian exile, and they were that the first five books of the Old Testament were, for all practical purposes, propaganda that was being used when the, the children of Israel were coming out of Babylon to give them a story. And so somebody made up the Exodus story to bring the Jewish people together. That's the theory. If you were to go to Sanford, you were to go to Beeson School of Divinity, if you were to go to any... Uh, secular or more liberal-leaning um, place to be taught, you would be told that. M- uh, even some conservative literature will lean on J, P, E, and D, uh, critical theory or literary theory. Okay, so what do we do with that? Because the Bible, in reporting itself, makes it really clear who wrote it. We have internal evidence. In Exodus 24, 4, and Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Exodus 34, and the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for in accordance to these words I've made a covenant with you and with Israel. And so the books themselves say throughout, and Moses sat down and wrote this down. Also, uh, we have external evidence. The New Testament in Matthew 19, John 5, Acts 3.22, Romans 10.5, and Mark 12.26 all refer to the author of verses in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and New Deuteronomy and says, as Moses wrote. For example, Jesus says in Matthew 19.8, he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wife. But from the beginning, it was not so. Jesus believed that Moses wrote the, old, the, the Pentateuch. Now, for me, as a Christian, to the fact that Jesus said that Moses wrote it, I'm done. I really don't need anything else. But how do we explain the different language, the different uh, usages? The use of Yahweh, Elohim, El Shaddai, Uh, Those kind of words uh, is easily explained. It's clear that the author wants us to see God in his various roles. Elohim is used throughout the Old Testament, including in 
book of Psalms and in the prophets, whenever God is referred to as Elohim, that is the God of power, the God of creation. We need to understand that God is not your homeboy. He is not your buddy. And I would say in our country and culture, that's one of the hardest things for people to get through their minds. When you hear Oprah talking about God, she's not referring to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She's referring to a God of her own making that's not worried about your sin, who's your papa, who's sitting up in heaven, and if you crawl up in his lap, he's going to give you a silver dollar, and he's not worried about what you do wrong or right. He just loves you. That is not the God of the Bible. And we need to remember that in the Bible, God is presented as everything that is, is because he made it that way. He is God. He is the creator God. And if that's all we knew about God, he would be a pretty terrifying person. And so, and that's not the only aspect of God. Now, don't think that this is contradictory. We were talking just a few minutes ago about being a father. There are times when with my children, we're not discussing this. I tell my kids on a regular basis, I don't argue with children. I pay the bills. You're living in my house. We're not discussing this. We're not arguing and debating. I just told you what you're going to do. Now, your options are to do it now or do it after you're miserable. But you're going to do it. And you know what? I got time, buddy. We can work through this. And it, So you, your choice. I set before you a blessing and a curse. You can either do it and grumble in your heart all you want. I don't care. Or I can make you miserable with a, a, a applying leather to your rear end and taking away everything that you know and love. I can take uh, all of your electronics. I've got no problem putting them in the woods. I love targets. So we can have some fun with this, or you can do it now. That's one aspect of, of what I have to do as a parent. There are times when they need that. Now, almost always with my kids, after they've calmed down and they've obeyed, Then I will sit down with them and say, now I want you to understand why we had to do it this way. Because if we did it the way you wanted to do it, this was going to happen over here, and this was going to happen. You're not thinking this through. You need to think. The reason why you wanted to do it this way is you wanted to get it over with, and I was telling you to do it this other way because I want it done right. Or the most common argument in my house is you will not talk to my wife that way. So you can turn around and walk out of this room and come back in and do it right. And then later, I'll go sit down on the edge of their bed and say, your mother loves you. There is nobody on this earth that has sacrificed more so that you would be happy. There's nobody on this earth that stayed up at night crying, praying for you. And so you need to show her respect and you need to show her love. Now, both of those, I'm not being hypocritical by in one case saying, we're not going to discuss this. And in the other case, sitting down and explaining why we're doing it that way. There's two sides of the same, or the opposite sides of the same coin. And we see that with God. We have him as Elohim. Power, authority, sovereignty. There's no discussion. There aren't ten ten suggestions. There are ten commandments. And in Hebrew, the ten commandments are actually pretty funny because they're all monosyllabic. It's God's assuming that we're stupid. Killing? No. It's like he's talking to a three-year-old. Have you ever done that to your kids? You know, there's no, 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 no. And then you've got to go get them and move them away from it. God's like, lying? Uh Uh-uh. No, no. Stop it. And so Elohim is always presented with authority and power. Yahweh is a God of relationship. God says, I want a covenant with you. Yahweh says, I'm sending you, Moses, to, for, to my people. Whose people are they? They're his people, and he loves them. In the book of Hosea, he says, I gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks. In the book of Hosea, it also says that Israel, my son, I caught up by his hands and taught him to walk. 
Isn't that a beautiful image of God holding a little boy's hands as he's teaching him to walk? Yahweh is always presented as the God of relationship. God's many names show us the various aspects of his character. El Shaddai, the God who provides. El Sabbath, the God uh, uh, who gives us rest. There's over and over in the Old Testament, God is, is, we're shown the many facets because God is so huge, it's hard for us to understand who he is and how he is. And so the writer uses different names so that we can see the different aspects of God. That's not difficult to understand. And we do that all the time in normal language. As we're describing a person, if you think about the descriptions of any great uh, historic figure, Churchill, for example, I, 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 I love uh, Churchill and I love to read about Teddy Roosevelt. And as they're described, they'll use different nicknames or um, in the, the book, um, Teddy Roosevelt, Emperor, Empress Roosevelt, he on purpose uses the pet names of his family for the different descriptions of him. It's exactly what's going on here. And nobody's going to read that and go, well, Teddy Roosevelt was really written by 50 different people. That's just silly. Read maturely. That's how people communicate. When you get to the different language that's used for the priestly work or the deuteronomical work, there's nothing to suggest that Aaron didn't write out the priestly rules and Moses compiled it. We've talked about the fact Moses did not write the story of his death. Somebody else had to write that. That's not shocking. Moses isn't the one who came up with the story of creation. He wasn't there. That story had been told by, from, well, we can trace it at least back to Noah. He told it to his kids, who told it to their kids, and then maybe somebody wrote it down, or maybe somebody just kept telling it in an oral tradition until Moses wrote it down. That doesn't negate the fact that Moses was being used by God to capture that story, and that would explain why there's different language usage throughout how many anthologies do we have? And so, to me, the, the whole J-E-P and D theory is just an attempt by Satan to say, did God really say? Hath God said? And we know who's the source of that question. But I wanted you to be aware of it because, again... I was not made aware of it, and I, it shook me to my foundations to realize that people that I had looked up to and respected didn't actually believe the Bible. And so I want you to understand that that's, that is an argument that's brought against God's Word that's not accurate. For a date, that's a little bit harder because nowhere in, in the book of Exodus does it say this is the date that it happened, this is the date that it wrote. As cl up to in 1 Kings 6.1. And in 1 Kings 6, 1, the Bible says that uh, it was 480 years from Israel's departure from Egypt to the fourth year of Solomon's reign, which occurred in 966 B.C. And that would mean that the timeline that you have down there is act, that, that would be following it. So that Israel goes to Egypt around 1876 B.C., Moses is born around 1526 B.C., and Exodus, uh, the, 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 the Jews were... Exodus from Egypt in 1446 B.C. Since there is explicit uh, thoughts in 1 Kings 6, 1, that's what I believe. Now, there is an argument that's made that that doesn't line up with the character of Ramses who's mentioned in the Bible. I'm only 50 years old, but throughout my life, lots of times, it, I've seen archaeology catch up with what the Bible says. And so when archaeology contradicts what the Bible says, I'm going to lean on the side of the Bible. That's just because I'm a redneck from Gadsden, Alabama, and I'm a silly, scripture-shackled rube. But I want you to understand that there are uh, theologians who believe the Bible and believe God who say that because we know from uh, various and sundry steles uh, when Ramsey II was ruling in Egypt, that would back everything up about 600 years. The theme overarching all of Exodus is that um, God's promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob 
he fulfilled. That's the point of the book of Exodus, that he did what he said he would do, that he told Abraham, from your seed, I'm going to bless all the earth. Remember when he said that, Abraham didn't even have any kids. What are you talking about? And he repeated that promise to Abraham's sons. I'm going to bless the world through you. And then Jacob has 12 sons. And then they go to Egypt and they have a bunch of kids. And God fulfills the promise that he made and made of them a great nation. So let's look at the overview. I found this online last week and I... I started to, to recreate this, and then I thought, no, I just like that. I'm just going to give the guy credit um, and, and use it. It's really cool. So it divides up the book of Exodus between God redeeming his people in 1 through 18, God's covenant with his people in chapters 19 through 24, and then God tabernacling with his people in uh, chapters 25 through 40. We see, first, that God took his people out of Egypt. And God knew what he was doing in, uh, as he did that. You know, going back to the whole conversation about daughters, um, I have a speech that I give. And I always do it cleaning a gun. Uh, I will, will ask the boy, and, and this boy that we're talking about, Will, poor thing, uh, he, he, I said, um, come talk with me. And he sat down and I said, Will, uh, you go to church, right? And he's like, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I want to ask you a few questions. <clears throat> and they all expect, you know, what are your intentions with my daughter? What's your job prospects? And so I always say, did God harden Pharaoh's heart or did Pharaoh harden his heart? And you just watch, can watch the color drain out of their face because that's not what they were expecting. Excuse me. I- I'm asking a simple question. Did God harden Pharaoh's heart or did Pharaoh harden his heart? Because in the book of Exodus, it says both. It says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let my people go. And then other verses, it says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Which is it? And I'll let him struggle for a while. While I'm cleaning, uh, 45, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just working it with a Q-tip, looking at them knowingly, letting them talk. And then I'll say, okay, so here's the deal. As Moses wrote the book of Exodus, everything that happens has two causes. A primary cause and a secondary cause. And to the Old Testament writers, the primary cause is always God. If you were to ask Moses why did it rain, the primary reason is because God wanted it to rain. Secondary reason is because, you know, we prayed for rain because we needed crops. Or, or this happened, that happened, maybe even a semi-scientific reason. The, the rain falls to the ground, it evaporates up in the air and forms clouds, and then they rain. But the primary cause is God. So whether Pharaoh was in his mind hardening his heart or not, God was the primary cause. God was hardening Pharaoh's heart because he wanted to teach his people a lesson. You see, if God had just put on Pharaoh's heart and crushed Pharaoh's mind and took his people out, you saw how, see how much trouble Moses has with him in the wilderness anyway. Why did you bring us here out in the desert to die? We could be sitting by the Nile eating cucumber sandwiches. We need bread. Here's manna. Bam. So you see how much trouble they have as it is. So they for 400 years have been watching the the Egyptian people worship gods. Now, we could laugh at that and say it doesn't have an impact. I would say on a regular basis, I will have Christians... In this church, ask me, do you believe in ghosts? I've had Christians very seriously ask me, do you believe in alien abductions? Do you think that there are people out out there? I have someone recently say to me, "Um, my house is demon possessed. Will you come and cast the demons out of my house? Now, where does that come from? That comes from our culture bleeding into people's minds. People, they see movies, they read books, they hear stories, and it gets into your head, and then something crazy happens. You walk in the kitchen, and and, you've got a mouse problem, and you hear scratching in the wall, and you're like, well, I don't believe in ghosts, but right now I'm kind of wondering. Things happen. 
And that culture impacts you, right? It does. We all know it does. William right now is taking English 201, and they're, uh, they're studying different genres of literature, and he's having to read a, a, in the horror genre, and he's having to read a Stephen King book for this college course. And he read about three chapters, and he said, nope. And he went to Emily and said, will you read this and tell me what it says? Because I can't read it. It will keep me up all night long. And he, uh, whenever anything even slightly scary comes on, he'll sleep with like a steak knife under his pillow. So we, don't, we say we don't believe it, but when it goes bump in the night, right, our culture impacts us. Well, they've gone for 400 years and watched these Egyptian people sacrifice to these gods, worship these gods, see things happen. So God hardened Pharaoh's heart so for a several-month period, God could just show them how powerful these gods are. You want to worship frogs? I'll give you some frogs. You want to worship cattle? I'll knock them dead. You want to worship that river? I'll show you I can do whatever I want to with that river. You want to worship Ra, the sun god? I'll black the sun out. So that every one of those people knew beyond a shadow of a doubt when they marched through the Red Sea, those gods may be real, but Yahweh is way more powerful because he just played with them. And so God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. By this time, I've put the gun back together. I've got the ammo in the magazine, and I've put the magazine in the magazine well, and I will jack around in the chamber as I say, if you hurt my daughter, the wrath of God is going to fall on your head. I'm the secondary cause. (laughs) So... And I, you can ask some of the boys around here that's dated my daughters. They, they, will, they will verify that speech. <laughs> that's right. And Emily wonders why she can't get a date now. Um, so God redeemed his people from the land of Egypt. And then he covenanted with them. He made a relationship with them. He told them very explicitly, If you, I set before you a blessing and a curse. If you obey me, I will bless you beyond measure. If you disobey me, I'm going to work against you. Do you agree to this covenant? And they all said, yay, we agree. And Moses, after having sacrificed a lamb, scattered blood over the people to signify their covenant relationship, the marriage, if you will, between God and his people. And then... Beyond belief, God didn't just create a relationship with them. He tabernacled with them. He came in his Shekinah glory. He told them exactly how to build a tent. He told them exactly how to make the furniture. He told them how to, how, what, what layers of this fabric and this kind of metal and this thing. And he said, I want all of the stuff in there to be holy, separate, only used for my worship. And I want you to make a bronze table and I want you to make this kind of bread and I want you to make this kind of perfume. And y'all are going to like that perfume. So if you use it for anything else, I'm going to curse you. And do blah, 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 blah. And he walked them through exactly how to do everything, which tells me that we don't get to pick how we come to God. He gets to tell us how we come to him and how he has chosen in these last days for us to come to him is through his son. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And when Aaron's sons decided they were going to play fast and loose with that because God's a God of love, he struck them dead. And so he tabernacled among his people. He dwelled with his people. Think about the ridiculousness of that statement. No other God in human history has done this. No other God that we can imagine would think to do this. He actually came down and rested and led his people. Which is why in John chapter 1, as John takes that idea uh, in presenting Jesus, and we see what that tabernacle is a picture of. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and life the life was the light of men. 
The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So John paints this picture that Jesus is God, no doubt. And then verse 14, and the word became flesh, and in your English translation, it says dwelt, but the word there is tabernacled amongst us. The exact same word that's used in the Septuagint for what God does in the book of Exodus. The picture of the tabernacle with God coming in among his people is a foreshadowing of the fact that he was going to come as a man and walk amongst us. And so the book of Exodus, we said that Jesus, as he walked on the road to Emmaus, told his disciples, walked them through the law and the prophets and explained to them how it all taught of him. Well, with the book of Exodus, it screams Jesus And so I I hope that this overview lets you see a little bit about what's going on in the book of Exodus. Uh, Next week, we're going to take up Leviticus. Uh, There aren't many people that will say to you, um, well, this week I'm going to do my Bible study in Leviticus. We're going to talk about it, and we're going to see where Leviticus points to a Savior. Father God, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for um, the way you gave it to us. And we thank you that you did not leave us ignorant to who wrote it and, and how it was, was presented to us. Lord, we thank you that uh, you promised that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will not pass away, and not one jot or tittle will be changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.